Oh. Hi, everyone. So thank you for joining this session. Uh, I'm Chris from Liberate Science, and we are a worker co-op um, democratizing research work. And today I'll be sharing some of the first steps we're taking um, in order to democratize research communication. And I'm going to try and keep it nice and short today because of virtual uh, conference, I, a lot of stuff going on. Um, for me, I also noticed that my energy is draining quickly during the day. So I'm, when I tried it out earlier, it was like between 20, 25 minutes. So there's ample space to ask questions if anything's unclear. Um, and if anything comes up afterwards, feel free to reach me anytime, uh, also in the Slack or on Twitter. Um, but if I want you to take one thing away from this session, it's primarily that we are convinced that the article format, as we know it today, is the main bottleneck to, uh, to improving science uh, as we move forward. Um, that's based on lots of research uh, throughout the years. It's been proposed almost 22 years ago by researchers from Elsevier, actually, but nobody ever uh, went ahead and bothered with actually implementing it. But I'll explain further uh, throughout this session. Um, and the structure is primarily going to be a bit of me talking and a bit of demo um, and then some back and forth, uh, uh, if you would like. But before I begin, um, I'm going to, let's see, make sure that everything works and want to introduce you um, to Caroline. Uh, she's, she's a showcase for who we'd like to democratize research communication for. She's imaginary, she's not real, so she gave imaginary consent to be mentioned here um, to help us illustrate some of these issues. And just to give a bit of a, a, bit of a picture of who, who she is, she is an early career researcher um, from the humanities. Uh, she works with data, with all kinds of stuff, so digital humanities. Um, and what she does is she produces all kinds of outputs. She produces, uh, during her research process, she produces code, she produces um, videos, uh, audio files, write-ups of protocols, um, some data, and pretty much everything in between. Um, and she loves doing this. So this is her passion, this is what, uh, all the stuff that's, that pertains to doing actual research, that's what she loves. And then subsequently, when she has to write up a research import, a report, she still enjoys it, um, but she finds it difficult often to do justice to the various steps of her research and how things actually happen. Uh, she feels she has to tell a story and that also she feels that she have to, has to put into words often things that would be simpler uh, uh, if she could, for example, with respect to data, simply attach those data, which nowadays is very difficult uh, in publication-based format. And subsequently, you know, she's written this article, she's put in all this effort to do the best she can to write this report of all the steps she's taken. And then she goes through this whole publication process and she starts feeling distraught. So you notice uh, uh, she goes from all the way on the left really loving this kind of work to feeling small and being distraught on the right. And it takes long, it costs money, and in the end, it's just the same uh, kind of work that she produced before, but different. Uh, at least that's what we're always told. And knowing what goes into a publication herself, having experienced it, Caroline also wonders about the publications she, she sees in the literature. And she asks herself, is that really what happened? Uh, is this a story or is this uh, proper documentation? And from the last 15, 20 years of meta research and way before that also the science and technology studies, we know it often actually isn't a good representation of the process. And examples include adjusting predictions, uh, selective publication, bad data storage, and a lot of other issues. And Andrew talked about several of these issues that I know a bit too, uh, um, too close to home sometimes, given my history in psychology. And we are really trying to address a lot of these issues at the root, instead of trying to uh, take the journal publication and lump some stuff on top to try and introduce uh, open data by you know, making them a requirement in the supplements, but really putting them front and center right at the beginning. Um, 
So what we need to do in an article-based format, we often need to reverse engineer what has happened uh, because the report is inherently after the fact. And that is where for us, um, at, least, at least where I feel the core of the issue is. Uh, because if we don't communicate differently, uh, we can make the, the version control as tremendous as possible, but it always needs to go through this publication system. And that also means that the people who control that publication system also have the power to say, we're gonna change this and maybe not this. Even if it's good for science, it's this question of whether they will be convinced to actually change this. Um, and so here are several other issues that are related. Uh, this is from the reproducibility manifesto. We see publication bias, uh, failure to really do proper study design, quality control. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of these aspects uh, could be improved if we change from this after the fact reporting to more as you go reporting, which also opens up this whole space to actually provide more feedback to each other, to revise work when it's still relevant and not just at the end when the study has been done and then the reviewer says, well, maybe you could have done this and you go, oh shit. Um, we really wanna open up this whole space to make it easier to get feedback, give feedback and build on each other's work. And even with preprints, the issue remains. Uh, the report is still after the fact. The study's still been done. It's a bit less after the fact because we're moving a bit earlier, but still. And what we propose is to actually communicate sooner than preprints to get away from this after the fact uh, norm in science communication. And also we have to remember that exactly that bit is also what Caroline was most passionate um, about to begin with. So focusing on these research steps, this research output uh, in its most direct way, um, that's where we're gonna start out from. So now we've sort of made the journey from what Caroline does in her day-to-day -day work now. And now I wanna change the scene and talk about what we think this process could look like. Um, so before we can actually start doing anything with these, uh, uh, with these research steps and make them the focus of research communication, we need to introduce some new structures uh, to unlock, unlock the full potential um, for a different way of communicating. Because we can't just go and dump all this information because that would, would overwhelm us even more than we are now. So the first step that we need to take is we need to order those research steps. Um, we need to order them to, uh, to include the chronology of events into the communication process. And that way, uh, the research steps can start telling their own story by showing how the information produced evolves over time. But that is only the first step, because even if we would do that, how do we actually understand what this structure would look like, whatever. So subsequently, uh, we need to make this, um, this new structure have a container that can include all kinds of different research steps. So uh, that we can sort of homogenize all these various research steps and make them um, uh, comparable in that sense. So this is a way for us to make sure that we can provide a stable data format for a large variety uh, of research outputs. And once we start doing this, we, so we, now we have this order, we have this structure of, okay, this is a container where you can put your research output, regardless of what form it is. Then we can also start including these links to really trace back um, what the process was. So we can actually, when we look at one of these containers, one of these outputs, we can say, hey, what preceded it actually? And then say, what preceded that? So we might say a results section, hey, what data was actually behind it? And if there wasn't any, then we at least understand, okay, there wasn't any. So we can really uh, change the unit of, of reviewing, of communicating, and also then trace back those steps um, that resulted in some output. And it also allows us 
to branch out new research paths. Because we all, as we know, uh, these research projects, they are thinking keeps evolving and sometimes new ideas come up, say with data, we have some new ideas we wanna investigate and we can just branch off, add some code, run a new analysis. And that really makes the research process much more flexible than it is now. Because if we start retracing again, we don't actually need to rehash that original idea on the left again, because it's all included in the history. So especially if we start thinking about this in the context of replications, um, et cetera, it really makes it much more cost efficient to produce this kind of information because the full history is already included. And those outputs can be all kinds of things, also tables, graphs. Um, we're actually proposing to use Wikidata to do this, but that's a whole different story. I'm happy to go into depth into that if anybody's really interested about it. But this, this idea of going to the research steps, ordering them, linking them, making them, uh, giving them a containerized format, that's, um, that's what is included in the peer-to-peer uh, -peer commons. At least we're calling it the peer-to-peer -peer commons uh, because it's based on peer-to-peer -peer technologies like torrents, so nobody owns it. Uh, it's fully distributed. Uh, and these specifications are uh, set to standardize how we communicate those research outputs in order to make them uh, more manageable. So those are those containers. How does one of these containers look like and what can go in and what information should be there? And then the specifications also ensure um, that by communicating research steps, we have a documented process which mitigates all these questionable research practices that we see are highly prevalent throughout uh, science and depending on the field though. And also to ensure interoperability uh, to, to democratize how we utilize the communicative research because now we're so siloed in that actually we can't really, you know, just take it from one place and go to another. The Peter Peer Commons really says, well, we wanna make this fundamentally interoperable. This is just the, we, we just say, this is the container. This is how you should put stuff in and then everyone else can start using that information. Um, they can build websites with it, they can build uh, mobile applications to you know, make it easy to consume it, whatever. And also by utilizing these peer-to-peer -peer technologies, which is why it's called peer-to-peer -peer commons, um, we, we ensure distributed access in order to make knowledge available to everyone um, outside of anyone's control. So it's fully open by default, no paywalls, um, and all these steps then can, um, can be accessed by anyone as long as they have the internet. And ultimately, one of the things also, it's not just about producing the information and sharing it and being able to make it human readable. It's also about this machine readability um, and the, the set of specifications also makes uh, makes it one of those core fundaments to, to allow uh, reuse uh, in order to have everyone be able to build on the available knowledge and help stimulate innovation in research discovery and research production, evaluation, or archival. So anyone would be able to build on top of it. And uh, within Liberate Science, we're building the software development kit and those specifications. Uh, which can then be utilized by anyone to build uh, a desktop application or, or a mobile application or whatever. So that's the peer-to-peer -peer commons is really about how do you build the road and not yet about how to use it. Um, but that's where hypergraph comes in. So hypergraph is one of these ways uh, to use the peer-to-peer the -peer commons. And that really, the core there is, is that we bring this the structure into a user-facing application um, so that researchers uh, can start communicating these research steps, link them, et cetera. And uh, Caroline seems interested in this, uh, at least. So today I wanna give you a short demo uh, 
of the, the hypergraph version that we have now. Uh, it is an early release, so it's not full functionality. So I'm happy to uh, answer more questions. I'm quickly going to check in the document whether there are already questions. Okay, not yet. Oh, someone, how does this relate to blockchain? Uh, it doesn't. Uh, I don't like blockchain, to be honest. Uh, it's too much uh, hype and very little um, effect. And I can share a blog post that I wrote about this, but this doesn't relate to blockchain at all. Um, so no worries uh, on that front. It's more comparable to BitTorrent um, than anything else. Okay, just going to quickly switch the screen I'm sharing. There we go. Let's see. Um, do you now see the screen with welcome to hypergraph? Yeah, okay. Just want to make sure um, Zoom doesn't give good feedback on that. Um, so this is when you have downloaded Hypergraph for the first time. Uh, you boot it up. Uh, this is what you see. So we try to sort of make this introduction. Uh, pretty much all the stuff that I talked about just now is then summarized in two paragraphs. So it's given me a newfound appreciation of copywriters. Um, but as we click through it, uh, I'm not going to uh, leave it now. We're going to include some more stuff. But then it immediately asks you, OK, um, you want to make a profile. What should we call you? And this is, uh, this is a name I'm going to put in now. We could adjust it at any later time point, which I myself changed my last name when I was younger. Uh, and I know from other people. Oh. I guess I'm cross chatter. Sorry, got a bit distracted. Um, the the fact that a lot of people have issues with their names in the current publishing system we actually say this can be fully dynamic um that's uh that's something that that i'm pretty excited about but for the moment is uh, not necessarily relevant um so i'm going to pretend i'm caroline for today um create a profile and boot up uh, hypergraph so the first thing that we're going to see is the workspace and there is nothing here yet, which makes sense. Um, at a later stage, we're going to include a whole social connection aspect so that we get a central feed. Um, and so that if you boot it up, you can immediately start consuming content. But for now, we're primarily focused on using, uh, building this um, for your personal project management use as well. So we go to add content. And we immediately, that's where this container comes in that I talked about before. And we can select, okay, what kind of container type uh, or content are we producing? Um, so today, Caroline has been working on design. So uh, study design, so I'm gonna click that. But we see there are a whole bunch of options and we can add more and more to them. So these options are uh, based on Wikidata. And let's see, if we do that, we can just start uploading files. So now I'm going to select um, these three files. So that's almost half a gigabyte already. Um, it has a protocol video included um, and uh, some, some a PDF. And what we then always have to do is include one main file. That it's similar to an index.html file. Uh, for a website, this is the one that if you would open the module, the container, what is the file that, uh, that is open in that situation? So this is, uh, I'm just going to say this is the replication procedure for someone. I, I actually took this off the open science framework, so it's real uh, uh, materials. And what we do here then is, so we create, if we click add content, we create one of these containers and put all that stuff in. Um, so it takes a short moment to make sure all the, all the files are moved into this container. And subsequently, because this is a big file, it takes a bit. Subsequently, that module, uh, that, that container is shown in the workspace. 
Um, and if we open it up, we can actually just click on any of these files and we can immediately um, start. Oh, it shows up in a different screen. We can immediately start uh, looking at it. We can be like, okay, uh, the video. And now I'm just going to hit publish. And at that point, immediately, all of that content would become available to anyone you're connected with. So this would technically be the full publication cycle that I just showed you for that one research step. Um, we could see it in Caroline's profile. Uh, at, some, at a later point, we're going to be introducing that you can actually include the social aspect. And then you can see this stuff coming in to your computer just a few seconds after they hit that publish button. Um, and then you can build on it. So you, uh, we're, we're gonna pretend we're Caroline still, and now we're two weeks down the, down the road. And we, we have used that procedure and we collected some data. So what did we do? Well, that's simply a next step. We don't need to interact with this whole uh, uh, container of the replication procedure anymore. We hover on this and we click on the plus button. And that's then the next step. And then we again select this content type. This time we, we select data. We add some files. And really we want to make this as boring as possible because it's so, because then it's so easy. Um, so now we just add the replication data again. Um, and of course, in a, in a regular situation, you would be adding a bit more of a description for the demo purposes. I'm just being, um, I'm not really being very precise here. Uh, it's also fake, uh, fake stuff. I'm not actually gonna leave it up. Um, we again add this data and then we go into this container and we can see replication data. Um, we can still publish it. We can open the data set. Um, and above here, above the title, we actually see the preceding step. So we can just click on that and we go to that one. And then we get all of these files um, and then we can just go back. And to showcase that it's not just stuff happening in this, uh, uh, in this application, but that you can actually uh, easily utilize all the content that's available there, we can hit open folder. And then it takes you, all the files you see are immediately on your computer. And this could be your own research work and at a later time point, also someone else's. And it's all there, ready, ready to go. And what that also means is that if we now, for example, should, uh, just quickly going to publish this. So it's in a profile. Then we can actually one of the final steps, and this has been my personal annoyance. Uh, so if we would now add a step that, you know, talks about the analysis. I personally love using our markdown, but I hate the fact that whenever I'm done, I submit a Word document or whatever. So all this R markdown uh, material gets lost in the end. And now I have an HTML file and an R markdown file that built it. So I can add that into this, uh, into this container and then say, okay, the main file is this HTML file, but the supporting information is immediately there. We can rerun it um, if we want to. Um, and then we can add it, oh, not 1955. We can add that content again. We might add a description. Um, and we can publish it and then we immediately see the published version is actually the R markdown file um, that you've created. So we see that we can, without any third party interacting in our process, we can actually uh, publish these, um, these fully fledged documents with information in there, very specific. Um, and we can then go back and see this whole trajectory. And what we also do is we add here this follows from. It's another way to showcase where does this information actually come from. 
So now we see analysis results is preceded by the replication data and then preceded by the replication procedure. And of course, in this demo, we're just showcasing some fake data. It's still just for one person, but it showcases that it's very easy to go from booting up the program to creating one of these containers to adding files that are way bigger than what we're used to now. And technically we could add up to gigabytes um, and then hit publish and then it goes out to all of your colleagues. So I'm gonna quickly switch to the, um, to the document to see some questions. I'm gonna stop the share real quick. Um, okay. Uh, let me just... So this is always a, a hassle with so many windows. Um, and if you're interested in um, helping us test this over time and really co-creating how this is gonna look like, because this is very, um, very minimal still, we're working towards the version one by the end of August, but if you follow this link, um, you'll get uh, signed up to our tester list and we, we could invite you to participate in one of these tests and you know, help us really refine, uh, refine it to such an extent that it also includes the functionality that you need for your research uh, or what you would like to see. Because I showcase some uh, scenarios, but there are many others that we can imagine. We also want to be able to, for example, think about uh, how can we support, do we support um, IPython notebooks? If you export them to HTML, is that sufficient? Uh, all of this kind of stuff. And we really want to make sure that we're um, co-creating this with the researchers who we really try to serve here. And um, finally, I'd like to recognize that this is not just my work. Um, we, we've been uh, around, so this idea has been around for a few years, but from September onward, we got, uh, we got funded by the Shuttleworth Foundation. So now we have a runway of a few years to really um, collect a lot of people and to work on this. We have some really great uh, engineers on board, designers, and it's a large project. And if only the surface of it today. Um, so also if I pique your interest, I'm happy to continue talking uh, and answer um, any of your questions. Um, so I'm quickly gonna stop talking and open up the floor for questions. If anybody wants to, let's see. If the folks who have asked their questions in the document, if they want to raise their hands and ask out loud. I'll happily break the silence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Chris, is this related to Octopus or the DAT project? So um, it's not related to the Octopus project. Uh, and it is um, what, for those people who are unfamiliar with the Octopus project. Uh, it's uh, run by Alexander Freeman from, I'm not sure, Cambridge or Oxford. Um, Cambridge. And, uh, yeah. And she also has very much an approach to uh, communicating research steps. Um, so the difference, as far as I know it, is that Octopus has a very strictly defined set of research steps. So what I showed you actually, the, the selection we made right now, that's in the drop down menu, uh, theory analysis, etc., cetera, uh, was inspired by Octopus. I've helped them test their product uh, a few bunch of times. We very much say, we want to be very flexible about what goes in there. The user determines this. Um, and our work actually builds on the, the DAT protocol. So we utilize it. Um, and that's the peer to peer technology that we utilize. Uh, and that also immediately indicates a difference with Octopus. So Octopus is very much a centralized platform um, where you communicate those research steps in a very specific format um, and we say no we want to decentralize that process we don't want to give one entity control over it um, and we want to make those a bit more flexible those containers um, let's see 
So I, I see one of the questions was about the funding. So I already answered that. Um, so we, uh, we have a runway for another maximum of two, two, two years and six months, I think, uh, to run with the team. And our uh, goal is to, our, let's see, we did one with 4 million, we could run for 15 years. So that's sort of the, the timeline we're thinking. And we really want to try and stay very, um, very minimal uh, so that we really don't run too much, too many costs, but that we can really provide a long run service because this is really a long game. Um, and also ties into this, this, this next question that I see. Um, I don't know who asked it. Uh, that was um, me. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Um, about um, replacing traditional scientific publications. Uh, so I think that the main thing is that the scientific publishers are so, um, they have so much money, so much power uh, that actually sort of inspired this idea to go be be before the publication because that actually is outside of their uh, power domain. They, whatever we do before publication, that's up to the researcher. And um, we saw, we see the same with preprints that legally speaking, they have zero um, ground to say, hey, you're not allowed to publish this with us. Of course, there is a whole social component to it. I don't want to minimize that, uh, but we really want to make sure that it's a, it can live in parallel. It doesn't need to compete. And if then ultimately people like this more, then maybe it becomes less, but we really also actually want to encourage people to use it in parallel. And then at the end say, hey, these, these containers, they should go into paper. Can you just export it real quick for us and that we produce this, this file? Um, because everything is machine readable. Uh, so we could probably just produce a PDF for submission for you. Are there space limitations like in in image analysis world there's it's easy for like a terabyte of data to go in a of raw image data to go in a in a publication so uh theoretically no uh you could add as much in there as you want just as you can make torrents as big as you want there is then the question of who is going to make that information available uh so one of the things that we want to do as liberate science is provide one of these hosting facilities uh, and storing a terabyte. If, if, if it gets downloaded once or twice, it's already gonna um, quickly uh, cost some money. So there is a, a certain, uh, certain trade-off there for files up to one gigabyte. We wanna be pretty, pretty straightforward and would be like minimal cost for larger files. Uh, we still have to think about the, the business model, but theoretically you could, yeah. Thanks. Uh, so one of the questions is um, whether different instances of hypergraph are talking to each other and whether it's one instance per user. Uh, so the, because of the peer-to-peer -peer technologies, they will be uh, sharing that information. Uh, and there is indeed a critical mass issue, and that's where also our service to make sure that, uh, that this information is available from our servers who will participate in the peer-to-peer -peer network um, to make sure that you, know, you don't hit download and it takes forever to get the files. Um, so we really wanna, before we can really shift to this fully distributed system, we do need to sort of find a, find a transition time uh, by providing those servers. And the anonymous camel is taking exactly the right notes. Thank you. Um, let's see. I can read the next one out loud if you want. Sure. Yeah. I don't know who, it, who asked it, but it's about discoverability. How do people find the data analysis, et cetera, that they want to read and reuse? Yeah. So we are primarily, so there are two approaches to this. One is say, Rachel is using hypergraph. She sends me her, uh, her profile link 
and then um, I follow her and she follows other people. And then I can sort of say, how deep into this network uh, do I want to go? That's one way. So we can just crawl through all of the links um, and see how that works. The other is when we start prov providing this hosting service, that also gives us a centralized um, uh, list of information of these links. And that's another way, which, and we're going to be including that in, in the application once it's launched. So you can actually go there and get this feed once you download it. And you can be like, hey, I know this person, I'm going to follow. So there is a, a double approach. It's a network approach and just a, the regular feed approach that we know um, from a lot of centralized services. So let's see, one of the later questions is how public are the outputs? Uh, so I think that uh, uh, once a link is shared, it's, uh, it's fully public. So I think there is this, we should really see this as the, the same gravity as a publication. Uh, it's once it's out there, it's very difficult to get it back um, because you have to destroy all the copies. So in that sense, it's also very important to when, when one of these research steps gets communicated to ask yourself, is this something I can publish? Uh, we often get this question of, but how about sensitive data, private data? Uh, I think that's a very important question. And I think that it, that responsibility, exactly because we are not an intermediary, we simply say, we give you the tool to, to publish it, um, that uh, they have to then think, okay, is this something I want to publish? But we also don't want to say, hey, we're not responsible at all. So when somebody says, hey, this is a data module, we will be introducing um, the, just a, a checklist, uh, just a, uh, to, like a warning kick or a con confirmation. It doesn't contain any private information or personally identifiable information. Um, and down the line, we really want to, depending on what people do, we want to introduce all kinds of tools to actually make that easier. Uh, to go from, for example, if, you're, if you are depositing private information before, to go to some summary data or um, what's it called again? Uh, uh, that you use this, these differential privacy algorithms uh, before you deposit. So we also want to make some of these innovations more accessible to the end user. Um, One of the other questions is, how do you envisage the publication system tying into the reward evaluation system? Um, that's a very good question. And there I'd like to refer back to uh, the network that these containers start building. Uh, and then we could actually start asking questions about um, how the research progressed. So we can really start asking these questions about the network. Uh, one of the proposals I, I always think about is in the Netherlands, there is a, a grant scheme for professors to really promote um, and fund those for up to 2 million euros uh, for those who have produced a real research line. And nowadays with publications, it's somewhat difficult to actually see whether those are a co coherent set of outputs. And in a network, we could actually measure that and say, well, what is the connect, what is the density or how interconnected are these outputs actually? Or are these just small islands distributed across? Uh, so actually this went into the design. So we really want to uh, open up this uh, um, question driven evaluation uh, for the network. And we'll be also providing within Hypergraph uh, off the shelf analyses for people to, uh, to answer some of these questions and provide a service to, for more refined questions. Um, I'm really happy with these questions, by the way. Uh, these are really good questions. Uh, I've never been to a CW20, so I wasn't sure how technical I should get. So. Mm -hmm. And then, let's see, that's uh, 
the I final think there's question. one more. Yeah. yeah. Is it possible that there could be separate competing peer-to-peer -peer networks in Hypergraph for some reason? So the short answer is no, uh, because we're really uh, going into this very specific um, peer-to-peer stack. Uh, so if you think about the interplanetary file system is not compatible with this. That's also a design issue, not necessarily from our end, but from the, uh, from the protocol. So each of these uh, containers has a specific versioning to it. And uh, some of these other protocols like the interplanetary file system, they have a very different design. They only do this at the file level and we do it at the folder level. Uh, and that's really vital for how Hypergraph and the peer-to-peer -peer commons is set up. Um, and we couldn't replace this with torrents because uh, if, if we could, I would have very happily done that. Uh, but this is definitely a one peer-to-peer uh, -peer network that we're going to be including. Well, if there aren't any more questions, just going to put up the link if anybody wants to uh, sign up for testing uh, I'd be happy to uh, oblige <laughs> and I'm going to put the link into the uh, doc as well and there is also if you'd be interested to just stay afloat of the um, I hope this one of the development uh, you can also sign up for the newsletter uh, so that when we get to a later version, uh, if you would want to install. Right now, uh, it's a bit early still, uh, but uh, we did, I'm very happy that, uh, that we could do this first demo uh, and show you all of this stuff that's been, I think, in the works for two and a half or three years, um, idea-wise. So, um, Is and this if the there very are, first demo? This is the very, very first demo, yes. Wow. So this is a, a premiere. Well, if, if there aren't any questions, uh, feel free to, well, it ended up being 40 minutes after all, not so quick, uh, but I'll hang out here for a bit longer. Um, if Joe could stop the recording, then people can also just do off the record questions. Um, I, I do have a, another really quick, maybe a clarification mm -hmm. um, about the, the funding. So are you envisioning, envisioning the future funding to come from, uh, say, government sources that care about open research or are you seeing the future funding about selling data on how people use the, plat the, the hypergraph or both so, or something else? That's a very good question. Um, that's also very much at the forefront of my mind. I very much don't want to be reliant on non-systematic funding because I think that's a big issue. Uh, so this is also why ultimately we set up as a for-profit entity, but as a worker cooperative um, so that we will, uh, so we, we are looking to create business models, but one of the core aspects of it is it needs to respect the user. So we're really looking into how do we provide services and not sell the data. Uh, so this is where the hosting uh, part to make sure that this information is seeded comes in. Uh, there is also a part where the network analyses, we wanna really provide the service because these networks as they really grow bigger and bigger and more complex computations that we say, hey, we'll run it for you. Uh, if it takes a month on your computer, it might take us one hour and you have to pay five bucks, um, that kind of service. And also to start building these uh, text and data mining uh, tools to really uh, synthesize that information better and to help produce better information. Uh, that's where our core business models are going uh, because I really, really, really um, despise the fact like what ResearchGate is doing or what these data-driven models are doing uh, in other places. So I look forward to if any data broker ever emails me to share those emails and uh, just be like, no, this isn't happening. Cool.
I also see a question about what platforms. Uh, so we run Linux, Mac, and Windows. Um, and then down the line, there will be mobile uh, as well. But that that is a bit, that is down the line. Um, and thank you for the affirmations for those getting it. We have a raised hand from Andrea. Yep. Hi, Chris. Uh, thanks for the great presentation. Um, wait, let, let me switch uh, my, my camera on so you can see my face. OK. Yeah. Uh, so um, my question was about you showed a big nice button with publish. And I, my, my question was, is the publication uh, staying within the circuit, the peer-to-peer -peer circuit of, of hypergraph, or it, it, it relies there is a kind of plug and play thing with, a, I don't know, other mechanism that are more unknowledged for, for scientific publications, such as preprint servers, uh, Zenodo, or anything similar than that? Yeah. So at the moment, it's definitely uh, within the hypergraph ecosystem. Um, and what we are doing is that hosting service I, I alluded to a few times. Um, we call it the vault because um, it sounds pretty cool. Uh, and uh, what we do is there, it sort of acts like a bridge so that you could actually, if you have it in the vault, you, we give you a link and you could just share it with anyone. Um, so they don't even need hypergraph, they could just view it. Um, and uh, so, but yeah, all of it is open. So we could provide integrations to Zenodo if you would want to. Uh, that kind of stuff could could happen. Um, we could even down the line, maybe if somebody wanted it in the Open Science Framework, we could talk about that. The only downside there is is that what they do, they very much operate at the project level. So really, this connection between the research steps, which is core to what we're trying to do, would get lost there. Um, but that is, I, I see, uh, if people want it to, do, to be synchronized somewhere else, that would be perfectly reasonable. Yeah. Yeah, I was asking that because it rang a bell. Because, uh, I mean, I'm working for Open Air, mm -hmm. and, uh, which is, you know, is another part of Open Air ecosystem. And uh, one thing we do in Open Air is that it's basically by um, Open Air Connect and provides API to Zenodo and to Open Air as well. So, we have um, a way to bridge research infrastructures that are serving uh, research communities uh, to the publishing end, to the scholarly communication end. So basically, uh, we we run some pilot some pilots, um, and one the most recent one that I've seen presented is for the European Plate Observatory System, so geology, seismology, and so on, and uh, they basically hoped their own services uh, to run in silico experiments, and then they automatically publish onto Zenodo data set parameter, uh, like semi-finalized results. And so all this integration is seamless. So it's kind of, I mean, I, 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 dig, I dig what you said, because in, 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 in hypergraph, you, you keep track of all the time spent uh, for the um, research cycle. So you have you have um, sequentiality and causality of, of things, how they happen in time, what is the order, why. I don't know if this can be reflected, for example, from this automatic work, publishing workflow that we have in OpenAir. Uh, but I was I was trying to uh, map the two things onto it on onto each other and see what is the overlap and what can be the extensions, the potential integration. Thanks. I think there are a lot of parallels there. Um, one of the things also, I showed you the desktop application. You can actually programmatically add new research steps. So you could actually say at the end of each research day, all the data gets deposited into one of these steps and then we collate them uh, at a later time. frame. So it can go all kinds of directions. Uh, it sounds like that is uh, something potentially worth talking about more. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Esther.